architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash, and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode, we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues that are broadly around architecture and architectural and design thinking. And we try and imagine what architecture could be, what it might be, what it could become. And I'm very happy and excited to have with me here today Anna Telks who is a fashion designer, an artist, a businesswoman, and a performance specialist. And we're going to try and talk about fashion and architecture. Welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you for having me, Vikram. I'm pleased to be here. So, Anna, you grew up here in Seattle. You went to SU, and then you studied industrial design, here at the University of Washington. But then you got into fashion. Why fashion? That's a fantastic question. Um, there was a brief moment after leaving Seattle University where I actually transferred to the University of Washington to study sculpture. I happened to sit in on a class where George Scott, as a professor, spoke about industrial design. And so by the time I learned about industrial design, I thought, ah, this is exactly the way I'm going to learn how things are made. And to preface that, I had actually spent um, a summer, I think it was 1999 or 1998, knowing I already enjoyed fashion, I had gone to uh, Central St. Martin's in London for the whole summer. Um, you just happened to be going to Central St. Martin's? No, I had actually been living in England, and I knew it was the best. I was already a religious follower of fashion, and I knew I wanted to get there, but I didn't know how, by hook or by crook, I would get into the Why fashion industry. Why were you already a religious follower of fashion? So I grew up in a household with two hippies for parents who were very heavily influenced by rock and roll in the 50s, 60s. That was their religion. It was in a way, exactly. That and being vegetarian and deep into the music, all the records we could listen to um, were available. So I'd look at the covers and I would see David Bowie in something that looks a bit like female garb or I would see... Alexander McQueen designed that for him, didn't he? Oh, at one point, we'll get there. This is probably hunky-dory in the 70s yeah. still. So yeah, right. I think maybe Alexander McQueen is influenced by that. Uh -huh. And so Mick Jagger in his studded tearaway pants, um, cropped uh, football jerseys in the 80s. There was a lot of fashion that was uh, shown to me through music and how you could perform it on stage. That's right. Come to think of it, stage shows are all fashion shows. Entirely. And now they're so prescribed, I barely have any patience for them. Yeah. When people dress themselves, let's say, before they had... When rock stars were rock stars. Exactly. And they had their own personal style. So I don't know how that exactly got me into making things in my bedroom, but you could easily say when I started going to punk shows and was very much a part of a DIY culture, which is do-it-yourself, starting from scratch, believing in yourself to be able to make something as good as something you could find in a store. DIY is punk? Well, do it yourself um, was one of the facets of punk. I thought the whole point of punk was to put a finger up to anything that was. So I see that's why it's uh, DIY. Anything that's manufactured is it prescribed, and you don't want to be part of it. Yes. And there's that fantastic line um, by the Sex Pistols that says, "I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it." And I think that that's also a part of. I'll make it up on my own if I have to. I'll make it myself. I don't even know what it is, but. Uh, because it comes from me, it's going to be better. I, that's how I take take that line. So by the time I had the wherewithal to go live in London after having started some college education and having spent most of my life in Seattle to that point, um, I went back to where I was born, which is London, and took the time to uh, enroll in a six-month summer program at Central St. Martin's which is um, an art school there, but it also has a... Well, it's the famous art school, yes. It's a famous art school and almost more famous for its fashion. All yeah. the famous designers of the 90s. Uh, sort John of... Galliano, uh, Alexander McQueen. So you were at the right place. I, I knew I needed to go there. And when I showed up, it was incredible. Every single human speaking a different language. People from Asia, from all over meeting to just... 
And what was it like to be in one of those studios? What was the creative atmosphere like? Everyone was a little terrified. Everybody was terrified of each other? Not of each other necessarily, but of wanting to be seen as new and original and fighting to kind of find your... Was it cutthroat? At that stage, it wasn't necessarily cutthroat, but I remember the teachers were strict. And I remember I actually received a bit of a um, cold shoulder from some of the instructors being American. Just because you were American. And I I could actually respect it. I thought, hey, this is is it. I've made it. I'm here. Um, There's the famous teacher, Louise Wilson, who is the master's. She's now since passed, um, but she was the one that everyone looked up to and wanted to work with. So you'd have to get through your undergraduate to even get to that level, which was, um, as a summer student, I was basically just looking in. How did they define creativity? Like, what was the expectation about being creative in that studio? Well, the classes I took were a little more perfunctory. I took a, a pattern making class, and I took fashion draping, and then I also took fashion illustration. And there wasn't a lot of room to express creativity at that level, but what you could tell from the energy or the palpable experience of walking down the hallway where things were graffitied left and right, there were these lockers that were almost looking like they had been burned at one point. It was the old building that is now no longer in existence, unfortunately, but uh, things we pasted to the walls, parties that were happening, um, pieces of artwork that had just been abandoned recklessly in the hallway. There was a lot of action that was almost more of the imbibing of the nature of the school that didn't necessarily translate to your class immediately. But where I felt the most challenge creatively was that, you know, coming from Seattle, there was obviously an influence in music. But outside of that, I was fairly unworldly compared to a Taiwanese student raised in Paris who had come to London for her A-levels. There's just a, I felt a little bit behind knowing what was going on. I had a lot of interior landscape that I had worked on since working on my own in my bedroom from being a teenager onward. Um, But interior landscape? Yeah, the interior landscape. What's interior landscape? The interior landscape is your own voice. I've never tried to actually define this. Aesthetically, it is how you see the world. The influences that you have either repeated in your mind, leaned on as a crutch, aesthetically, emotionally. Some designers work out their problems through an aesthetic. I think for myself personally, I've always been drawn to the performative aspect of fashion and how it transcends a personality or lets you execute a different personality. But I'm also very interested in the ritual of dressing. Where do you think that came from in your life? The ritual of dressing? Because we're going to get to the dowsing soon. Uh, I think... I I didn't have any real 2020 or hindsight on where this came from until I spoke with Louise Croquet, who had been the curator at the Henry Art Museum here at the UW. I came to speak with him about my work, The Dowsing, which we'll get into. Um, And as I was describing the artwork I was making, he said, did you at one point come from a um, any kind of religious background or, you know, your work could be seen a little bit what would be the word? Is it ceremonial or I don't want to say... Yeah, dressing up the priests and the bishops and the popes is a big deal. And so I was raised in the Episcopalian Church as an acolyte. And what does that mean? This is something that Louise helped me tease out. Essentially, so every Sunday when we would go to church, my sister and I both would walk back um, behind the scenes, so to speak, and put on a red floor-length cotton cloak that over the top we placed the final part of the acolyte uniform, which was a roughly white overpiece. And and what did you feel the moment the uniform was on you? Do you feel you transformed? I remember feeling as if we became more classic and more neutral and almost timeless. So you felt you were no longer you? Possibly more me, for the sake that there wasn't the usual... I'd say 80s or 90s disruptive jeans with neon t-shirt. I, I was really never interested in modern dressing as a child. I was not... But you did feel you transformed. You metamorphosized. True. You transubstantiated. I love that, yes. And it did feel proper. There was a level of propriety in changing clothes. Um, the idea of changing seemed the only way in which you would actually 
present properly in church. And so, yes, that was enjoyable to have the uniform to change into and something that you knew was other in my mind. Whether or not I personally felt transcendent in the outfit, I felt more I made sense for the proper space and time at which I was being asked to wear that outfit. And so you feel you were wearing the right... So it's not like you felt bodily different. You felt you were wearing the right translator, the right user interface. Exactly. Oh, that's well said. Yes, that user interface that allowed me to then participate properly. It, it was like a mask, the right mask. Yes, but I can't stress enough how it actually felt as if it was cleansing the palate, taking away something from modern society and replacing it with something potentially more pure or simple. You felt that putting on those clothes cleansed you? Cleansed myself and the other acolytes. And I remember I used to get very upset when the shoes weren't matching or didn't feel as uh, ceremonial as the outfit. So this isn't just saying, oh, I, I had to have it a certain way. It was realizing that a pair of grubby Nikes at the base of this outfit ruined the whole thing. It was, not, it was about transcending to this other place while wearing the outfit. Let's jump ahead a little bit and actually talk about your artwork installation, The Dowsing, which I happened to see in Red Square. It's remarkable that you saw it. In 2013, where you laid out a carpet in the middle of Red Square. It was a kind of a wet landscape. It was a monsoony day or another Seattle day. I think it had snowed that morning, in fact. And you had these models stand at the head of the uh, runway and then describe to us what you did. That day, I had the models waiting in the wings, so to speak, and in the kind of brutal column behind... In Cane Hall. In Cane Hall, exactly. Yes. Waiting to begin. And as you said, it was a wet and cold day. And the models were dressed in what before they came? They were dressed in basic layers. So this is part of the artwork, uh, the dowsing which I make, and the models that wear the clothes always start in something that is not a naked body, but a, a basic set of jersey cotton layers that allow them to then have added layers placed upon them by myself directly. So why do you start with basic layers rather than the naked body? I am avoiding the discussion of comparative body types to such a degree that I've only chosen to work with male models. So to preface this experience of making artwork as the dowsing, under the name the dowsing, I had spent the last well, more than that, I'd spent five to eight years or so already working in the fashion industry, um, having to ask female models to succumb to nearly, I don't want to say unlivable, but impossible standards, asking women to be as thin as they can be and act as rails to better exemplify the clothing that was placed upon them. There's a two-sided two sword to this. As much as I am aware of how wrong that is in so many ways of asking people to bend to a certain body type that's nearly unattainable, there's the other side that my eye aesthetically had also grown accustomed to it. So as I had seen females thin as all get out, unable to eat lunch as they're worried about gaining a pound, um, I was aware that that is what the industry of fashion expects if it wants to see a female model. When I started making clothes, I wasn't sure whether they'd be performed. And then when I decided that they would be performed, I said, who can I put these on that will not distract or even play into that arena of fashion? So it's a feminist move. It's a feminist move, but it's also in deep appreciation of menswear. And so I chose male models. But why that, not naked male models? I avoided using any form of nakedness for the sake of... It's, in my mind, too distracting. We're not at a place where you can say, I understand that starting as a naked person is the purest, but as asking a model to step outside and be seen in public, I'm not trying to get anyone's ire up. I'm not trying to shock anyone by having a naked body that would then eclipse the conversation about what was being performed or being worn. Okay. 
That makes sense. All right. So the bodies, they are sort of base layer. Yes. They come down and stand at the head of your runway. So the base layers are placed on the models ahead of time. And in this case, and we base actually... layers are all white. No, actually, the base layers are a beautiful shade of pale pink. And the base layers for the dowsing that happened in Red Square were actually also black with bleached and dyed rusted parts. So I basically used a technique of rusting and bleaching that um, then shows up in other places of the collection. I had done that to the base layers. So some models were in all white, some were in pink, and some were in this kind of black or mottled. And, and then you dress them. Yes. So I was taking the form of this servant in this particular uh, performance. So knowing that I wanted to create a level of servitude, the designer usually taking on something more of a designer role. It was something I was eschewing. I was going towards a more servant oriented aspect of saying, I will dress the models. They are my muses. And that there's also a level of complexity of the layering in which I'm actually asking them to wear the clothing. So I would ask um, the model to step forward. I would place the first layer of garments on them. I would run my hand down their back and send them walking down the runway. And why, why run your hand down their back? As a signal to start walking. Almost the placing of a hand on the figure to let them know that they are both in the space with me and present, but also ready to go. Um, it was important to s touch them and make them feel calm. So the running of the hand down the back was something to let them know, to let them know just to relax and that they were in the present moment. Really? I would never have thought that. Did anybody do that to you, run your hand around your back? No. To relax you? No. I think it was an attempt to continue with the inclusive the inclusivity of what I was attaining in the performance of the dowsing. They do say that if you want to really give a hug, the best way to really give an intimate hug is from behind. It feels uh, uh, warm because you sort of spoon into their body, oh, whereas from the front, that. whereas from the front, it's uh, gestural. Hmm, I've never heard that. As a signifier to let the models know it was their time to walk, I was also letting them know that they should stand a little straighter and be in the moment. And they, the, the notes I'd given them as we were starting out the day before the performance, I said, imagine that you're giving your sister away at a wedding. Or imagine that you've come back from war and nobody won, but that you did your best and that you survived. So there was this level of the connection between giving your sister away at a wedding and surviving a war. For the idea that the wedding symbolizes ritual as well as tradition, and in a place where maybe you'd be on your best behavior, but you're also caring very deeply about the thing that is happening, and assuming a brother's relationship to a sister might be one of protection, that marries into the idea of a war well, a soldier coming back from war who it essentially has survived but probably has seen some intense things but is coming back to the people they protected and is then being asked to either present what they found through their experience or just to show up and be present after something that was pretty intense. That's definitely World War One. I was thinking even further back. I mean, the way my imagination goes with the clothing is it could be as far back in time as the very first time humans wore clothing. It's a fantasy world unto itself. And of course, the materials, some have stretch, but in the way in which I'm sewing the garments, most of it's done by hand, very slow techniques, smocking. But you were looking at 19th century clothing for dowsing, right? For the actual layering component, I was taking upon two different references. One was menswear. So in my past life working in fashion in New York, I had worked for menswear designer Tom Brown. And for every jacket that we made um, by hand out in the factory in Long Island City, there were eight layers of fabric between the interior Bemberg lining and the exterior wool. And what that does for the garment is it allows for an ultimate, I'd say, tectonic plates where the pieces of the clothing move to where they're needed to go as it relaxes and as it breathes and as the human wears it, it fits more and more to the body. And that layering was actually juxtaposed to 18th and 19th century dressmaking, which is a 
bit of research I had been doing at the Henry Art Gallery in their archives. They have 35,000 different pieces of clothing in the archives that anyone's able to go and check out if they'd like to. Uh, You can go there and I looked at dresses and I looked at the undergarments of the dresses and I was looking at ways of building volume through dressmaking that then paired with the layering of the menswear to create some level of influence into this dowsing that happened in 2013. That being said, there is this inner landscape we spoke about. So there's this understanding that my aesthetic as all these pieces of information from research are coming through my brain or through my inner landscape. They're going to come out in a way where I was choosing to move slowly, so slowly, uh, use sewn techniques that maybe you would never see in production garments for the sake that they're too expensive, uh, labor-wise. And there's a whole reasoning behind that, and it has to do with more with imbibing ritual of the performance with the ritual of sewing, attempting to make a product that maybe reaches a little bit deeper than the off-the-shelf H&M t-shirt. The entire aesthetic of the show felt... Um certainly old world ritualistic the wedding is the right reference a soldier at a wedding seems like the right right reference i mean and even would it be fair to say that the clothes that you made almost had a solemn 19th century quality to it I could say the way in which humans used to be dressed by other people if they were of a certain class. Um, You'd have a servant that would come in or a porter and help you put on the more difficult pieces of clothing. And only until recently, I'm talking Victorian era or so, menswear was actually much more difficult or as difficult as women's clothing to put on. And then with corsets and women not being able to actually dress themselves with crinoline and petticoats and undergarments that are so complicated that at times women were essentially trapped in their clothing. They needed servants to dress them. Yes, exactly. So you played servant to your models. Exactly. Hoping in some way that allowing the designer to take the step back to say I'm serving the muse and dressing them. Um, I was also putting myself into the performance, which I fought for many reasons for the sake of what is my place in doing so. The dowsing is a commentary on fashion. It's a commentary on the take, taking all the information that I learned while I was working in fashion in New York and then distilling it into the parts that I thought were making sense or not making sense. And the way in which I saw the system or the industry of fashion speeding up fast fashion coming on the market. The dowsing was my response to it and trying to actually say, let's slow down. Let's take the designer away from being the star and put them in the background as someone who is working diligently to dress the person who is then the star, the person who's wearing the clothes. Okay. We are talking to Anna Telks and we are discussing the relationship between fashion and architecture. We'll be back in a moment. back we are having a conversation with Anna Telks. Anna, we were talking about rituals and performances and I think what was amazing about dowsing was that it was located in a beautiful space. Red Square at the University of Washington is a ritualistic space. It's so self-consciously constructed with Suzula Library, which looks like a Gothic cathedral, with Cane Hall, which is like an abstracted and simplified Gothic cathedral, with steps so carefully constructed as if it demands theater to happen in it. Can you talk a little bit about 
how you see architecture or how you saw architecture when you were trying to design that performance, how you saw and navigated and interpreted the architecture of that space? Absolutely. For the first dowsing, a performance that was done the year ahead of that, so 2012, in the winter time, it had been performed in upstate New York, and it, would, it had started out in the woods. And having come from a theater background in some ways, studying it a little bit throughout college and grade school, there was this idea that when you go to the woods, things dissolve or they devolve. People can be their real, unconscious, wildest self. Were your models naked in the woods? No, they were not. They came out in their base layers, absolutely. So you weren't true to Rousseau in the woods? No, I was not. Um, the secondary part of the dowsing in 2012 was actually performing, again, the same show with more attendants, so essentially more of the servants and the dressing roles, but performed at the America Society, which is a more Aristotelian-style location. There was a entranceway and there was a doorway in which the models could then escape behind as a backstage versus a front of stage, um, which the woods just didn't allow. Everything was out in the open when it was outside. And then when it came to staging the show in 2013, I was working heavily with the Henry Art Museum at the UW um, to research their archives, looking at women's dressing um, as compared to men's layering and tailoring. And when I was considering where to actually place the performance, I had thought of two locations. One was St. Mark's Cathedral, which is an Episcopalian cathedral on Capitol Hill. And then the other place was outside in Red Square. And knowing that there was a level of, I'd say, ecclesiastical aesthetic to my work, I thought it would be too heavy-handed showing it at the cathedral, even though I was raised as an Episcopalian. So the idea of putting it out in Red Square happened for two reasons. One was, when I first started going to the UW, we heard these stories about how it was a place of revolution, how the red bricks along the time of um, the 60s and the revolution had been placed on the ground to create a slick surface. And if, and this might be just hearsay, but if a, a hose were blasted at a group of protesters, the bricks would become wet and therefore so slick and slippery that no one would be able to stand up and the rioting would just come to a halt. And I thought about that story. And then I thought about the bigness and the openness of the sky and how if you're not going to try to contain something but let it be its own, put it outside and let it take, let it almost, the energetic exchange that happens when performance happens is going to either, which I'm hoping it does, imbibe or patina the clothes themselves that the models are wearing, but I hope it also changes the space or the almost the chemical nature of the people standing and watching the show. And I thought, if we put it outside, it will be, again, this back to base, back to nature, back to a purity that maybe I can't replicate if it's inside of a, a building that's been constructed for the sake of either uh, Episcopalian church services or even... So that's fascinating. You think Red Square is nature. Absolutely. And here's the reason why. I mean, I was just recently <laughs> reading about how... I was describing it as a church earlier. Ah! Exactly. I see it completely as a church space. Massive church square. Well, is it a mixing chamber in that way of... It's not really a, truly a town square. Not a town square at all. It's a church. It's a church. And why do you think it's a church? Because it's got that massive Gothic cathedral facade behind it and very carefully staged spaces places for people to gather and face certain ways. True. And what about the obelisk? Obelisk is definitely a ma abstracted cross. That's fascinating. Placed off center as the focus, and it's got these two, three huge towers. I chose to place the work right in front of the obelisk, and I was not necessarily thinking of it as a cross. It really feels like you're replaying your old Episcopalian acolyte days. Yeah, I, I realize I've been looking for this sense, and I can't say anything other than pomp and circumstance, this sense of ritual that you get in the hushed stillness of a church service, and you sometimes get in a theater. But the background of theater being something of uh, behind-the-scenes in front of the scenes, the third wall of theater, being in the round or being placed in Red Square, there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere for the 
the reality of what's happening, which is dressing models in public so that they can actually take on this essence of um, propriety that I'm hoping that they reach. Well, I mean, look at the, the ceremonies of graduation in schools of any university is a dressing ceremony, right? You put on gowns on people, you hood them, you know, you give them dresses. They're all derived from church uniforms. You have a certain interest in uniforms as well, it seems to me. So I did go to school at a Catholic grade school, which allowed us to, and I say this not tongue-in-cheek, it allowed us to express ourselves more fully while also wearing uniforms. So we had a very strict... Very anti-American, you realize that. that My dad being English is probably (laughs) saying um, this conversation. Um, For the sake that you had such a strict parameter to work within, you were able to actually accentuate certain aspects of yourself more. Specific accessories you could put with your outfit, how long or how tight, different aspects of your skirt or your shirt that you were allowed to wear. No, but what does a uniform do? It can act as a reset button. It allows you to start from scratch and show maybe if we're all, so it's like a fantastic design challenge. If we all had carte blanche to do whatever we wanted with all materials, there'd be no way of comparing. And I've never thought about this actually until I'm saying it out loud, but basically if you let certain parameters be known, you get to understand better the depth and success of a design because you can compare them more easily to each other. So a uniform is an interesting way of comparison, which actually very nicely parallels sort of the have and have nots or the cool and the uncool that is so prevalent in the fashion industry. But how is the uniform a reset reset button? What does it reset? So would we say this is the personal aesthetic or the expression of self through clothing? A uniform takes away general nakedness. It takes away individuality that would be shown through body type, potentially. I mean, interestingly, uniform acts as a common denominator. I think that's where the interest is, honestly. Because if you start from there, you're able to make then subtle adjustments that then show themselves more clearly, or you're able to see more likely the strengths or weaknesses of a situation. In fashion, people use uniforms as the easy way out. They use it as a way of saying, oh, it's just easy. You set it up, you put it on in the morning. It's why dresses are often a very good category for women's women's wear and sales is that it's something that's so easy to put on and you just change the accessories and it feels different and it's very easy. But I don't think that's the reason that I love uniforms. I don't love them because they're easy. I love them because they actually accentuate both the rules and maybe there's a sense of propriety in that but then from that you're able to express more easily your own aesthetic within the parameters right so theater industrial design fashion artwork installations interest in business you work with a diverse palette of possibilities everything is interesting so is it just because everything is interesting or are you looking for something? I feel like there's a some kind of a sense of a quest to your work. I think I'm similar to you, Vikram. I'm looking for what makes people tick or what makes myself tick. And I've understood over time that learning is one major reason why I do what I do. I'm always interested in finding out new things. I don't really like resting on my laurels for that reason, but... The fashion industry is one that could interest me for the rest of my life for many reasons, and one of them is that it is unsolvable. What's unsolvable about fashion? You have an industry that on its own makes as much money as the petroleum industry, in essence. One in six people work in fashion, we now know this. Um, it, It touches everyone. It is utilitarian, as we say, but it also is able to transcend. Mm-hmm. And the transcendence is this artistry in fashion, which is so subjective, like artwork, you can choose a million different ways in which it can go. You can dress yourself daily a million different ways from day to day. But within it, we are all seeking self-expression. And then you boil that down into a seven-layer cake of the way in which the industry has a supply chain that needs to function, the way in which um, stores flow information to customers and how we're fed by 
marketing and ads and what we wear, we're all influenced by it, but yet we all get a choice. And so it goes back to this idea of free will and how we dress ourselves, which is endlessly fascinating to me. But let's, yeah, I agree. I mean, in the fashion is a fundamental of life in that sense, with food, clothing, and shelter. Those are the basics. How do you dress for your day as a professor, your day as an architect? For me, it's entirely connected to the ritualistic process. I feel like I invent myself when I dress, become somebody. I sort of feel like, who I do I want to be today? And then pick out my clothes based on who I'm trying to become that day. When you get home, do you end up taking your clothes off and putting on something entirely different? No. So I'm playing that character. Through and through. It's all theater for me. Interesting. But just knowing what I've seen you wear, it's a you're you're within convention of menswear. Oh sure, yeah. And but it's so yeah, it's a very limited. I try and push that. But it's truly boring. Well, you could also say that there's a subtlety to it. I mean, at this day and age, we are at such a meta level of fashion understanding that I go and work in a fashion office and we're debating the height of a shoe by an inch, or we're debating the look of the face of the model and the hair and makeup and how it places the garment in what terms and what would be better for sales. I mean, there's almost a molecular level at which we're examining fashion images and we're taking on so much knowledge through images daily on Instagram or however you're looking at your news, there's there's so much subtlety to it. So I think you could say within either uniform dressing, you're getting some parameters already taken care of and then moving back into the middle of where there's that gray area of changing or taking on your own persona. But with menswear, I find it fascinating for the sake that you don't have the ability to dress across, I mean, in your general profession as a university professor or as a professional architect, you are beholden. As a professional yes. architect, I should just be wearing black and I'd be done. And small black glasses. And small black glasses. I do have the you know requisite uniform glasses. There you go. Yeah. I'm very cozy. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So architects definitely like uniforms. Yes. And buildings are very much about uniforms. And we, you know, they're all about doing the 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 standard thing in a certain way with subtle variations. Don't you think that one of the most successful, I don't even think this is a trope, but one of the most successful em employed architectural pieces would be rhythm? The, the idea, idea that's of... That's uniform, yeah. Exactly. So in the chance of seeing a schoolyard with everyone wearing a uniform or lining up as the bell rings to go in, they're... they're in repetition of each other with subtle variation. Yeah, well, Frank Gehry is trying to break free of that. Ah. He tries to make buildings as if they were evening gowns. But it's so fascinating, even now with software design, the little bit I know of it, you're always looking for this sort of A, B, A, B, or A, B, A, B, C patterning, just to show that you're beholding to some level of uniformity and then breaking the mold to find that difference. Could there be some sort of idea that maybe what I'm looking for in uniforms is always that. It's a little bit of same, same, but different. Something like that. So what's in the future now, Anna? Uh, you are continuing along this fashion, performance art direction. Are you going to start your own line or are you going to make us new uniforms? Strangely, I am currently working on uniforms for a restaurant, which is a whole other set of issues in which to solve. Um, as I continue into creating my personal work, which is artwork, I'm going to shy away from saying it's a line of clothes and go straight to the point of saying I would like to make objects that still resonate with people on whatever level that they might find it subjectively. So if I make a piece that is a wall hanging and it lets me exercise a smocking technique I'm interested in working on and it catches someone's eye aesthetically, that would be great. Or if I decide to actually sew together a book of paper that then has drawings in it. I, I want all of the objects that I make to kind of be approached with the same understanding, that it is something that's made with intention, um, that it, it executes an aesthetic that I'm interested in. Well, we look forward to that. Thank you for coming and being on Architecture Talk, Anna. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. I'm Vikram Prakash, and our show's producer is Sadie Vechler. 
See you next time.